Hey, hello everybody. I know it's been a very, very long time since I posted anything. I've just had a lot going on. Um, today is March 16th, 2024. Uh, what you're about ready to see now is some footage I found when I was in, and I'll probably pronounce this wrong, I was in France, Normandy. I was at the uh, Saint Marie Eglise Church, the one uh, uh, featured in um, The Longest Day, where Red Button's character, John Steele, the real John, the guy, the real person's name was John Steele, but uh, uh, Red Button's plays the character and is stuck on the church steeple. But I just found this footage. I went to the Airborne Museum that was right adjacent to it. Um, Parachute Museum, Airborne Museum, very interesting. I just found that footage I wanted to push out to you folks. And even though it's right, it's March 2024, I probably shot that at the beginning of August on my Euro trip. Um, and then there's another museum that follows right after that. So I'm just going to run them all through so you guys can see some of the stuff. I thought the Airborne Museum was way cool. I was just so shocked. I really, I didn't get it out to you guys. So that's, a, that's what's going to follow. And it'll probably just come to an abrupt end because i got to clear all this stuff out. And then there's another video i got to put out for my um, uh, Adventure Vin site, which was the Wright-Patterson uh, Museum. Anyways, hope you enjoy it. I'm, I'm sorry I, I just found this, but I'm glad you're able to see it. Bye. So at the Airborne Museum, they have a really good timeline of what, how the Airborne troops got here. So you show them loading right in, so they leave on June 5th. They start dropping 20 minutes into June 6th. It's like the 101st, 82nd, 121 in the morning, C-47s. There's some gliders, 04 early morning and then the landing's right 6 30 in the morning so one of the things i wanted to do like i did with the landing in prior video when i got out there that morning tonight i'm gonna stay up late and be up there in the morning when um the purchase would have dropped in this area so this this sherman tank once again it has the um reinforced plating here for where the driver would sit and it has a external mounted 50 cal up top so one thing nice about being in the united states is that we have many many museums that show these tanks and armor uh, whether this one was actually used here or not i'm not sure at this point and the other thing too there's a lot of information that is out here when it talks about aircraft and paratroopers well being in the military 32 years two branches of service I had an opportunity to go to many, many bases, and almost every base or camp installation I've been to has uh, some kind of museum, or you're learning it through your job skill. So it kind of makes this enjoyable and relaxing where I don't have to read everything, uh, have more familiarization. Um, it's kind of like me being in a Route 66 museum. I could probably know what something is from a distance and not have to take too much time reading it. Uh, two major divisions, 82nd Airborne, and 101st. So as soon as you come in, um, I didn't even notice it, but there's a glider right here. I have seen gliders on display, but I've never really been this close to one. So this is a new experience for me. And uh, to Julie, no, I will not give a speech when I go inside the glider like I did when I was at the American uh, Allied Forces Museum in Berlin. You know, I said earlier that uh, was a drift that Sherman tank was actually used here in Normandy. And then I start to think, well, I'm sure they didn't import it from the United States. So by default, I'm going to say all the military equipment that we're seeing here on a big scale, I'm going to assume was either involved on the June 5th, 6th, 7th events, you know, 5th leading up to it and the 6th being the day of. So I'm going to say it was all, oh, that guy has an M1 carbine in his lap. That's kind of cool. Um, I'm going to say they were here, that they didn't, tried to get them imported from the United States. That would make more sense. So this is glider equipment. The interesting thing, when I was in airborne school in 1987, they still had glider symbology in some of their um, crest and ID stuff. I don't know if I could see any here. So what he's wearing, where I have my airborne wings, that's actually a glider crew member. He's coming in a glider, not jumping. That's someone who rides in the glider. And then this one here, those are, with the genus, that's the pilot wings. Now for my air crew experience this year, that's a crash axe. We actually have those today. 
uh, at least in cargo planes. And what it's designed to do is to cut through the skin of the aircraft. If the plane crashes and the doors buckle and you can't get out the, the uh, structured door, those are designed to cut through the skin of the aircraft to escape. Okay, this patch was actually still in use in 1987. I had something with it on it, I can't remember, but I distinctly remember that was still being used. It might have been in the regimental crust. These next two cases look like um, some personal effects of some of the glider or paratroopers. Okay, so in here, what you'll see, so those are um, combat infantry badge, denoted by one star means uh, more than one campaign. Regimental crust is there, and senior jump master. Those three stars that are in there, um, I don't know if I could, so three stars, one on each wing, and one in the shrouds itself, those denote combat jumps. So this individual did three jumps in combat. The last time those were issued is when the Rangers jumped in Panama and just cause in 1989. This is a camouflage stick. We actually still were using those when I was in the Army in 1987 to 1990. <laughs> Thompson machine gun. This looks like a parts of an M1 Grand. Okay, so I'm entering the glider. Oh, geez, this is kind of cool. So, I, I gotta tell you, all the movies I've ever saw, I always told myself I would never want to be in the gliders. So airborne operations have come a long way since uh, this era, but some similarities are if you see the back where the parachute would be. So the parachute is just kind of um, packed in here and then these have laces on them. These laces go up to um, a cord, I can't remember the name, and then you hook that up to the static line cable. So when you jump out, the cord is attached to the plane and it pops these off. It just pops them off and the chute comes out. Uh, the risers kind of look similar. The M16 went underneath our armpit in a canvas bag. Our reserve chute looked very much similar. Um, what this is kind of missing, and I don't know how they did it back then, but um, missing his rucksack or his own battle gear. Ours was attached to our harness, but it was a big bag. Big like our rucksack was by our thighs, kind of in between. We look like little. I'm not going to say, <laughs> kind of like pregnant ladies walking out of the plane, but um, that was there. So this is a C-47, which is the same aircraft we saw at the Allied Forces Museum in Berlin, where I actually did give the talk. That one was mounted up on some um, supports, so it looked level. But what I was explaining to everybody is that when these things landed, they were not level. Uh, the tail is where the uh, landing gear would be way down there is where the landing gear is so but the next version i want to say c48 i'm not sure um it's like a dc3 and a dc4 the face of the next version they actually put the landing gear in the nose so when it did land it landed and it was the fuselage was parallel to the ground opposed to having a pitch debris upon landing but i wouldn't i would imagine that during flight you wouldn't be able to tell the difference much but that's the big difference on where the um, centerline landing gear was. Was it in the tail, like that, C-47, or would it be in the nose? But the one we went on in Berlin looks just like this. This is a really cool museum. But once again, there's a lot of stuff that I know that, um, just through time, that I haven't taken a lot of time reading the, the plaques. What is cool is that it's showing the different operations, uh, Italy Operation Avalanche, on what gear they may have had. How it might have looked. This person, this paratrooper, has um, the M1 carbine with the collapsible stock along the side. Uh, jumping into Sicily.
this is Operation Torch. He's got a field telephone. Looks a little bit happier than the last guy. Some of the helmets that were used. Some of the patches. I gotta be honest with you, a lot of these I'm not familiar with other than the 82nd and the 101st. So I got a 45, some of the munitions. Got a bazooka back there. I think this might be a Browning automatic rifle, a bar, I think, I'm not sure. Springfield, 19, 19, 1911, 1903 Springfield? 1903. Uh, bolt action, Thompson and a carbine. Actually, it says what they are, but I, I have one of those M1 carbines, but I don't have the Pro Trooper version with the collapsible stock. So um, you got a M1A1 carbine 30 cal. It is a 1903 Springfield. A Browning automatic rifle, so that was that. Thompson. Okay, well, there you go, there's some of the inventory. I really like this museum. This is a mocked up briefing room where the paratroopers just kind of give you an idea you're inside. You're looking at the airfield and the outside that's raining. From 0131, the missions of the 1st and 2nd, the 1st PIR, the 3rd, 506 PIR. This is another one of the dummy paratroopers, and I have not seen. Yeah, I have not seen any of these in any museums in the United States. So, and here's a second one. So here in France, I've seen uh, three total. I've never seen these. I've always have. Now, in the movie D Day: The Longest Day, 1962 movie, um, the a German soldier comes in and he brings in one of the dummy pair, one of these. But in the movie, it looks like a toy. It looks like a real human being with a lot of um, characteristics. Uh, it's about about this size, maybe two and a half, three feet tall. And I thought that's what they were, but apparently they were made impromptu. And I can imagine this would all be what you need to deceive the enemy. And the idea was that they threw these out at different locations all over to confuse the Germans, and it did work. Also, the havoc innately that there was some... Um, miscommunication and some confusion amongst the paratroopers themselves also led to the disorganization on the German side. They didn't know where to go. So where are the paratroopers? They're everywhere. But yeah, I've never seen this. I've never seen a, uh, a real dummy one in a museum before. They have a, a few of these full-scale uh, soldiers around and like this white plaster. It's like hollowed white plaster, but they do a really good job. Actually, the helmet feels the helmet feels real. I think that's a real helmet. But there's quite a few of them, and they, it adds to the effect. It's really kind of cool. So that's interesting. You can actually go and fit yourself in a uh, parachute harness up there. I'm gonna check that out later. So this is the back tail end of the C-47. Oh, this is a cool scene. Check this out. Very well done. Anxiety, hope, and prayer. I knew right.
Robert had to have been there, as this is what he had trained for. And of course, as a volunteer, he would have been the first in. We heard about the casualties, the victories, and the sounds of war. And we at home just waited, hoping and praying that the telegram would never come. On June 15th, I received a letter from Russ telling me he'd not gone with his outfit to Normandy. I could only thank God. However, Russ had a feeling of, why not me? By then, he knew that he would have never have returned, as the plane to which he'd been assigned was shot down, with all lives lost. Russ became a liaison between the supply depot in Reading and the troops in the field. A few weeks after... Mm -hmm. I'm about to enter a museum ex, uh, exhibition, exhibit, a museum exhibit. I'm at a place called Dead Man's Corner. Uh, I'm actually in the building that was once used as a German headquarters. Later on, the Americans used it as an American headquarters. Let me flip the camera around. This is really interesting. So, I don't know if that's the very tank, but it was named Dead Man's Corner because a U.S. tank was hit and the tank commander was dead for four days uh, with his body halfway out of the cupola and the American soldiers couldn't get him out because there was so much fighting going on. So it got the name Dead Man's Corner as you turned this corner. And then I'm taking this from the building, from the house that the Germans commandeered. Now when I go inside, it's gonna show you a depiction of when the Germans had it as a command post. <laughs> This is um, this is the command post room, and they also made it into an aid station for the Germans. Uh, the Germans also or the Red Cross Band.
Ich gehe da mal durch, ne? Schau mal an der Hinsprache.